No amount of good mothering will protect your kids from having the full human experience. And that full human experience includes all kinds of things that we want our kids to experience. The joy of new friendships and discovering things that they're good at and that they love doing and and learning new things and experiencing, you know, new places and traveling. But it also, along with all those joys, it includes pains. The first love, your first breakup, running for a student office or trying out for a school play and, and not getting that working hard at something and having it not turn out the way that you wanted it to be or being embarrassed. (laughs) I think we can all think back to some high school moments that were pretty darn embarrassing. And there's just no amount of good mothering that you can do that will prevent those bad things happening to your kids too. And I know that you know that intellectually, but we also parent like we're trying to be so, so good that we can protect our kids. You know, like in practice, we're trying to be so good that we're trying to protect our kids from the pain of disappointment and failure and rejection and embarrassment and all of those things that honestly just go right along with being human. There's just no way to skip them. I wish it was different, but that's just not how it works. And so if you can't be such a good mom that your kid will never be disappointed or be sad or be hurt, what do you do? What are you left with? And That's what we're going to talk about this week, is how to expand your own capacity for disappointment or all of the negative emotions so that you can help your kids do the same. Welcome to Parenting Successful Teens, the podcast that cuts through the overwhelm and stress of this phase and offers parents simple, practical, cognitive, science-based strategies for keeping their teens on track. Join master coach and real-life mom, Allie Irwin, to talk about real teens, real problems, and the skills it takes to raise successful adults. What we're talking about this week is the idea that no amount of your good mothering, like you can't good mother your way out of your kids' problems. (laughs) And that is such a bummer because it is so painful for us when our kids are in pain. So I want to start out by saying there is no shame in wanting you know, your kids, like wanting to help your kids skip those very human experiences. And if it actually worked, I would be a big advocate for it, but it doesn't. It just doesn't. It's not possible. There is no pain-free life, and we wouldn't even want one if we could, right? Like it's the contrast of those experiences. Like we all know that. We've read all the greeting cards. It's a contrast of the pain that makes the joys, like the lows, contrast the highs and make the highs feel better. And so we wouldn't want our kids to miss out on those things, even if we could. And second reason for that is we wouldn't want our kids to miss out on those things, because if those things happen to our kids while they're at home, then we're, we're there to help them through them. Whereas if like the first time your child is ever disappointed, the first time they ever struggle is when they've already left home, then you have less opportunity to help them through it. I've said to many clients (laughs) that it feels kind of counterintuitive, but you actually want your kids to have as many problems as as possible in high school because that's when they most have your support right there. That's when your ability to help them and guide them, it's like most accessible. So if your child has a lot of problems in high school, in many ways, it's better than if everything is easy peasy until they get out on their own in the world. And of course, you're still there, but it's just a little bit harder. They'll be more prepared if they have some of those problems, you know, when they're still under your roof. 
So if you can't prevent the problems and you don't want to prevent the problems, what do I think you should do? The most successful parents expand their own emotional capacity to hold their own negative feelings. So if you can't tolerate your own disappointment, then when your child is disappointed, it's too much for you. Similarly, if you can't handle rejection yourself, which I'm not saying it's pleasant to handle, but you'll be less well-equipped to help your child handle rejection. And all of those things are just a part of going after what they want in the world. Applying to colleges, for sure, there's the risk of rejection. And if your child really wants to apply to a school, like baked right in there is the idea that they might not get it. Or if your kids are older, they might, you know, apply for a job. They might put their resume in at a company that they really, really want. And if you are super sensitive to the fear of rejection, it's going to be really hard for you to help hold space for them for the very real possibility that they could be rejected. You know, they could not get the job that they're going after. So what you want to do is you want to learn how to handle those emotions for yourself so that you can hold space, you create like a safe container for your child to have their own feelings in. Because if you don't, then you're going to need their pain to go away in order for you to be okay. And that starts to get into kind of dicey territory. Like when we, need, when we need our kids to be okay so that we can be okay, that starts to be a little bit dicey for moms. Okay, that can go in one of two directions and neither, <laughs> neither one of those two directions is good. So the first sort of path is perfectionism. Dana Dwarfman, a New York City psychologist, wrote this amazing article. I cannot remember where I read it, like maybe the New York Times, maybe the Atlantic. I'm not really sure. But it was so it was so good. She said that perfectionism is a maternal defense mechanism. And we employ it to believe that we can prevent terrible things from happening to our kids. It's a form of magical thinking to believe that if you're the cause, then you can be the solution. And so it makes perfect sense that you try to outparent your way to these feelings that you feel so uncomfortable holding. But it's magical thinking to think that that's going to work. You're better served to learn to handle the feelings yourself and then let go of the perfectionism. The second route that doesn't work is this sort of denying, minimizing that we do when problems come up that we feel uncomfortable just holding space for and letting kids handle on their own. And that's, like, if you believe, if you as a mom believe that if my kid has a problem, it's a problem for me. And you don't want to have that problem because that feels too uncomfortable for you. That pain of disappointment is is too great. Then you're going to quickly offer a solution that most likely your kid is not interested in listening to. You're going to, you know, because you just want to make it go away. And so you're going to offer a solution that your kid didn't ask for. And then they're going to ignore your solution. Then you're going to get in a fight. And you're going to say, I don't know why you just don't do it this way. And they're going to be like, sure, mom. And then they're just not going to do it anyway. (laughs) And it doesn't solve the problem. So offering a solution is one thing. You're going to tell them that it's not a problem. You're going to be like, oh, it's it's not that big a deal. Like everyone gets our heart broken. It's fine. There's other fish in the sea. You know, by next week, it'll be not a big deal. I never liked them anyway. Okay, that's sort of minimizing their very real feelings, which is not good. You do not want to be teaching your kids to like gaslight themselves into believing that they don't feel what they feel. Okay, the third thing that they do is they agree that it's a problem, but then you tell your kid, well, it's your fault that you're having this problem. Like if you just practice more, you probably would have, you know, if you just practice your lines more, you probably would have gotten the part. And 
(laughs) While that may be true, it's not super helpful to tell someone that is in pain that the problem is their own fault. Okay, that that might come later, but while your kid is disappointed, that's not the time. Okay, so this perfection doesn't work and downplaying the problem or telling the chi- the child that the problem's their own fault, not a good solution. So, it's not a good solution, but also I want to be so clear, have no shame if this is you because this is normal and this is so common, like it's so common in the way that we were raised. (laughs) It's so common in the, I'll give you something to cry about generation, which I am definitely, like that was definitely part of how I was raised. And so you have to learn a new skill in order to do it this other way. But this other way is so much better that it's totally worth it. And it's better for you Because you get so much better at handling these difficult emotions and it's better for your kids because then you're modeling for your kids how they can handle these difficult emotions. And it's also in expanding your ability to just feel disappointment, just let it be there, just let it sit, not stew in it, just allow it, just allow it to be there. In doing that, a couple of things happen. The first is when you allow your kids, when you develop your own ability to just feel disappointment, feel your kids' disappointment, and create a safe container, not for you to take their problems on, but for you to support them while they're feeling their feelings, you teach them boundaries. You teach them that you can be with someone who has a problem and not make their problem your problem. And your kids will come to you with more problems when you don't try to take their problems away from them, when you don't minimize them, when you just create a safe space for them to feel how they feel, okay? They'll know that they can come to you because you can handle it, and it's All you have to do is listen while they're describing their problem to you and say things that support them feeling the way that they do. Like, wow, that sounds like that was really hard. Are you okay? Just simple things like that rather than rushing in to solve it or tell them why it's not a problem. Okay, all of that is you getting mixed up and enmeshed in their problem. And you don't want to do that. You want to, if you think of this container as like your kitchen, you know, and they're sitting at the bar stools and they're telling you what happened about your day and you're listening and you're there for them and they know that they're safe in the kitchen to say whatever it is that what's going on for them and you'll just let them handle it. Okay, so this is a great way to teach them boundaries that you don't have to take on other people's problems, that you can support them without making their problems your problems. It's a great skill for them to have. And you're going to teach them independence. You're going to teach them like, hey, I believe in you. I believe that you've got this, that this hurts a lot right now and I can see you're really disappointed but I believe in you like you can ask them like ouch that hurt what what do you think you're going to do next what do you how do you think you're going to manage this how are you going to solve this okay you're showing them I believe in you I know you've got this and oftentimes when people are hurting That's what they need. They need your compassionate ear and they need you to hold your belief in them because right now their belief in themselves is wobbly. And knowing that you have a parent, just contrast (laughs) the two situations, okay? So picture your kitchen and you're starting dinner and your kid comes in and they tell you their problem and you're like completely overwhelmed by it. And you're like, ah, I can't handle this right now. You know, the chicken's burning or whatever. Versus, you know, they're just going to hold those problems to themselves. They're going to be like, I can't tell mom anything. Or like you jump in there and just 
start solving it and you call that friend of theirs that said the nasty thing, you know, you start saying that you never liked them and they deserve better friends and all of that. Like they're going to feel like a deer in a headlights and scamper away. So contrast that image to same thing. You're in the kitchen making dinner and they come in and they tell you what's going on and you're just compassionately listening to them. You're compassionate witness to their experience and you're, you're holding that space where you believe that they have the capability to solve their own problems. And believe me, if they want help, they will ask. You will know when they actually want you to toss out a solution. And if you have any questions, you should ask. You should just say, hey, I've got some ideas about that. Are you interested in hearing them? And then just let them say yes or no. Okay, these are the skills. Like your skill is creating that safe space where they can come and talk to you about what's going on. Your safe, your skill might be learning to bite your tongue because you might know the answer. (laughs) And you might really, really, really want to tell them. But that's not your role. Your role is to be a compassionate ear and hold the belief for them that they can solve this. Okay, if you have any questions, as always, Allie at AllieIrwin.com Or if you would like to talk about how to apply this to you and your family, (laughs) if you have, I used to joke that I could like sprain a muscle trying to bite my tongue. Like it was so hard for me to just hold that space and not jump in and try to solve things because I did actually know what to do. (laughs) And if you want to talk to someone that has stood exactly where you are standing, I can help you get, I can help you navigate these years so much more easily, so much more stress-free. So grab one of those free consult calls now and let's talk about you and your situation and how to make things easier and your relationships richer. Alrighty, talk to you next week.